get the topic going. If I don't remember, um, could someone remind me to ask you, if you don't mind, to share your presentation in the chat and I'll upload it with the rest a little bit later? Ah, uh, yes, yes, I will. Mm. Mm. OK, can you hear? Can you see that? I guess you can. Yep, looks perfect. OK, so yeah, this has been kind of something I was talking. I was thinking about for a while now to kind of get. Have kind of some kind of works of for. Using bioinformatics and a while ago I came across like a really nice galaxy workshop, so I managed to do some analysis in galaxy, which I will tell you what it is later. But I thought, OK, I've been doing everything without Galaxy so far. And it has been working mostly, so I think it's worth doing some bioinformatics with, but also without this platform to kind of compare the approaches. Um, OK, so bioinformatics, I'm not sure how many people actually work with bioinformatics in the meeting, but it's like a broad term for sure. Uh, and of course, the biology part of it, which is what we are particularly more interested as biologists, is usually related our, um, on genomics, gene expression and proteomics. There are I, th I would assume there are many things you can do, but these are the classic principles that uh, we tend to use bioinformatics with. And then how it might look for someone who works with bioinformatics. Uh, I will talk to you a bit about the files, the type of files that we might use. I will speak shortly about the pipelines, the workflows. And the third big part is about errors. So I will just briefly go uh, on these three topics. So the first thing about is about the files. So in bio bioinformatics, you usually don't work with Excel sheets, for example, or CSV. Uh, your data will probably, especially in genomics, will be sequence data. So the file format itself will be very different than other kind of data. So we often have fast queue files, FASTA files, SAM files, and BAM files. I'm not going to talk to you about SAM and BAM files at all, but basically BAM files is the least user-friendly, let's say, version of the file, and it's not meant to be user-friendly. It's just for the... It's in a format that is perfect for the computer to read, but we kind of don't have to worry about it. Uh, so a fast queue file, like the one on the top, uh, usually starts with a name of the sequence, which is usually how you acquire raw data. If you send, for example, some samples for sequencing, you will probably get your data in a fast queue file. So you will have the name of the sequence, then the actual sequence, the base pairs, as read by the sequencer. Then there is this empty, kind of empty line, which is just have the, the plus. And then there is a line that has quality scores that match the base pair. So for every base pair, you will have a quality uh, control character. So in this case, most are F, which is usually a good, a good score. Uh, and FASTQ files are usually, again, your raw data. They are usually really large files and they're usually compressed. And then another type of uh, data format that we come across a lot in genomics is FASTA files. And these are a bit more simple. You only have the sequence name, which is which always starts with a with a larger than character. And on a separate lane, you line you actually have the sequence, and you can have, of course, multiple sequences. The same with a FASTQ file. Then. Let's talk a bit briefly about pipelines and workflows. When you're working again with genomics, as in any 
type of data actually. You start with your own data and you have to come up with some conclusions related to your research question. And of course, in order to do this, you have to use a lot of different tools like software, uh, databases that relate, for example, your data with things we already know in science, let's say. So pipelines can be really, really long. They include a lot of quality control, processing of your data. And in genomics, there are a lot of standard pipelines that you kind of have to adjust always to your data set. So in this in the picture, it is a pipeline or like a workflow, but you have to consider that every step that here, for example, might might only be let whoops, sorry, let's say assembly and scaffolding. This looks like a single simple step, but in, in reality it's usually of course many more steps within every every step of the pipeline. And this can complicate, of course, your analysis. Um, but yeah, we typically talk about pipelines and workflows when we are doing bioinformatics. And then when it comes to errors, this is something that will become part of your life. And I'm sure because most of you are programmers to some degree or doing analysis, you have come across troubles with code and errors in analysis. And this is this is like a screenshot of some jobs I was running these days and I could see failed, 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 timeout, failed, which was not very nice to see, but at least I have some indication in this case, I have the, the error code, let's say, so I can look that up and see what it means and why my job failed. But I think for me, the worst mistakes are the mistakes that we don't even know we are doing. So sometimes your code will fail and you will know why. But sometimes you might try to apply a tool in your data that is not really the appropriate tool for your data. And even if the tool is going to run, your conclusions may not be as trustworthy. So this is a mistake that maybe you're not aware you're making. And then there are all these mistakes that the code is not running, for example, that you are aware. And these type of mistakes are usually have to do with software version, incompatibility issues uh, across different software, or you might have a pipeline that you are now using on new data, and you realize that there are there are all these small little things that are different in your new data that might make your previous pipeline not work, and you have to go in and check why. And of course, as always, there might be syntax error and coding mistakes that might take you a long time to figure out. And in all these errors, of course, AI is your friend and we have talked about it before. Uh, I use it a lot as well to try to interpret errors, but also to prevent errors just by making my code, uh, generating the code. Um, OK, so for this for this kind of meeting, I was thinking it's not going to be like a tutorial, so don't treat it as a tutorial, but it's more like this is something that can be done in bioinformatics. So we will have like I will have a task and I will go through the approach that I will use. So my task is to find the gut B alleles in the Volbachia of a fig wasp. So a bit of background why I would do this. So Volbachia is a bacterium that infects uh, insects and uh, it has different, it exists in different strains and uh, the type of strain each insect has can have some different effects on their fitness. And I'm particularly interested in uh, how different species of wasps uh, how is the pattern in different species, but for now we can only focus on one wasp, let's say. And this gut B gene uh, helps us identify the strain. So it has a lot of different alleles in different uh, organisms, uh, and this can help us identify exactly that, the strain. So my, our task would be to find this allele in our specific Bolbachia strain, of, of the insect that we have. 
And how I will do it? So my first approach will be to do it completely on the command line. And this would be like the typing approach, let's say, because I will need to be typing code into the command line. I will connect to the cluster where my data live, and I will also work a bit on my computer. And then I will also try to do the same, but for with using this platform that is called Galaxy. And it's a more, let's say, user friendly approach. It's more clicking than typing. And then we can kind of see the differences and yeah, maybe not which one is better, but which one is better for you, perhaps. So in order to, to complete the task, we will have to break it down into two main steps. So first we have to make an assembly from the row sequences. So the Volbachia I have is basically the row sequences that came out of the sequencing machine. So this is what I use as my Volbachia. But of course, all these sequences, they are short. They are only 150 pair base pair long. So I want to make an assembly from all, everything. I will try to make as much of a complete genome as possible without having all these multiple copies or ever generated from the sequencer and stuff like that. So the first step would be to make the assembly. And then the second step would be to find the specific allele that this particular strain has of the gene GAD B. So just try to find the sequence. And then I can compare, of course, the sequence to GAD B alleles from other species if I need to. So this is kind of the task. So I'm going to try to. Yeah, I'm going to turn off my camera for a bit. So I'm going to share my screen and I'm going to show you the two approaches, one with the command line, the typing approach, and one with the using Galaxy, which is a clicking approach, let's say. So in order to start the process, I'm going to open my terminal. And I know that in Mac and Windows it's a bit different, but every, every computer should have a terminal. So here I am in the terminal. I'm going to just adjust a bit. Mm. I have my notes here, so you don't have to pay attention in this script. I will just make the main terminal a bit bigger. Mm. OK, so you should be able to see. So Terya, can I ask about the notes that you have? Are, are those notes you made just for this presentation or is that your cheat sheet you use in your personal command line workflow? Well, I was I was doing exactly this kind of analysis these days. So I just copy pasted the bits that I, I want you to show just to make sure I don't endlessly look, look through my notes. Gotcha. So, yeah, this is this is a summary of something I'm doing. So now I am in the terminal of my computer. So this is my own username. It's my computer. And what I will try to do is that I will try to connect to the computer that my data live. So how I'm going to do this is something that I was told, I didn't figure this out by myself, but apparently by using this command, that is a secure cell command, then I will start typing the name of my username in the cluster, which I can just copy paste in this case, but I need to put space. So this is my username, and then I will add the name of the cluster where basically where my the computer that my data are. And now it's asking me for a password because of course if you want to connect to a computer where thousands other people have the research on, you need to have a password. 
and you won't be able to see this, but I'm actually typing the password. And now I am in the cluster. So this cluster is based in France, as you might be able to understand. So it gives me some, inform some information about the space I'm using. So what I will do now is within this cluster, I will navigate into the folder that my file is. And in order to navigate, I'm going to use this path because I already know in advance where my data are. I can just write the path. Oh no, the Greek. <laughs> and then one more. OK, and enter. So now you can see in the last line that it now has a different address, which is the path where the data I want to show you are. So if I actually want to have a look in how, in what is in this folder that is called raw data at the end of my path, then I would say ls, and this is going to list all the items that are in this folder. And as you can see, there are a lot of different items. So what I will do next, I will go one step forward and I will go into a folder that I call the multiplex barcodes. Oh, okay. So, Tyria, for the benefit of people that um, maybe they've never even seen a Linux command line before and are horrified at what you're showing them, how, how long did it take you to get over your um, learning curve for working just on the Linux command line like this? I don't know if I've, if I've gone through the learning curve. <laughs> you don't know if you're through it yet. <laughs> uh, I think I was lucky in the sense that I was introduced to the command line through a structured course. So at least there was some kind of idea of what was going on. And I think for me, this is the best. Otherwise, you can really get lost into your own computer, let's say. Yes. But for sure, a lot of people are learning on their own from scratch. And yes. uh, a lot of programmers, I feel like they're it's just like self self taught. Yeah, yeah. OK, thank you. So yeah, there is for sure a way to learn. I learned through my PhD. I had zero skills about the terminal. I was very scared about like, what is this? But yeah, I don't want to make this a completely like how to use a terminal uh, kind of meeting. But I just want to show you that, yeah, this is how it can be done, and this is how I have been doing most of my my analysis. So here now I have navigated into a folder by saying by typing CD and then space the name of the folder. Then I am it's like clicking into a folder. So now I'm I am in the folder called the multiplex barcodes bats. And if I want to see what is in there, I will again say ls. And if I add space and then minus l, then it's going to give me the contents, but in a list that, as you can see, it has a bit more information. It, it says time that you last processed. And as you can see, there are a lot of data, but we don't need to worry about them all. We're just going to focus on one specific example. So from all of these, FastQ files that are also compressed. You can see this ending that is uh, GZ. This is the compressed version of the FastQ file. We will only focus on one. So let's say that we have this. I have my cheat sheet here, and I want to show you that sometimes when you have compressed files, even like it's hard to, to read them, it's hard to understand what they are in. Um, maybe for this, I'll make it a bit smaller. 
Mm. So there are ways of looking into a file like this. So the command I typed here is zcat, then the name of my file, and then the pipe character, and then head. So this command will tell me to kind of display the content, the, the contents of this file. And because it's compressed, I need to add this Z in the beginning. So usually you would have cut and then your file, but because it's compressed, I need to add the Z. And then you pipe and then you say head. So basically this pipe means that you can just add commands, the one after the other. So the head command is going to show you only the first lines of your document. So by having this pipe, it means that it's going to show me the first lines of this compressed document. And you can see that this fastq file looks like before. We have the sequence, we have the sequence name in the first line, then the sequence, then an empty line, and then uh, some characters that are for quality. And then, of course, because we can't look at the data the same way, we can just look by clicking into a folder in our computer. There are ways of doing things with your files without even opening them. So, for example, with this command over here, it includes another like piping. So the first thing is the same as before. We want to display something from this uh, compressed file. And after the pipe comes this grep command, which will, which is a pattern matching command. So we are asking for we are asking for the terminal to show us information about this file only if this information has this character. So in this case, it will be the beginning of the sequence names. And because we also add the minus C, we want the command to count. So basically what's going to happen is going to count how many of these characters the document has. And because every sequence has this character once, then essentially we're counting how many sequences this file has. So if I press enter, then it's kind of calculating for a while and then it came up with that this document has a bit less than 800,000 sequences. So it's a lot of information and it's something that, as you can imagine, you, we wouldn't be able to handle like manually one by one or just by copy, pasting and analyzing uh, in this way. So if we want to make the assembly now, what I will do, I will navigate back into the previous folder. And to do this, I will just say CD space and two dots. So I'm now back into the previous folder, raw data. And then I'm going to prepare uh, a script that is going to help me make the assembly. So how we would make a script, I would say I would use this command. So this nano will open a new window that will allow me to edit my script. So if I now press this, so nano and the name that I give to my script. So now this is going to open a new window. And for the sake of time, I will just copy paste the entire script and I will explain what it means. So hey, can I make a couple of comments at this point? Because it's so fun for me to watch you show us what <laughs> yes. you're doing. Um, like one one of the things I wanted to just say is when you did that grep command, that um, you made it look so easy, but but actually it's quite a powerful, like an, an astonishingly powerful thing you just did. You reached inside a, if if I glanced at your file listing, and my memory serves me, uh, you reached inside of a about a two and a half gigabyte file, and you counted eight hundred thousand lines in it, so that you uh, could sort of weigh the pig about the shape of your data. And then now you're writing a script on the fly from this secure shell connection with a remote cloud computer. 
and you're using the little uh, command line program Nano. That's also horrifying to most people who have never used the command line, um, those tools like Nano. So it's just really fun for me to watch. I just wanted to comment on that <laughs> and how uh, impressive the uh, command line tools uh, like grep are. Yes, yes, and the grep is kind of, yeah, it's a very useful, as you said, and you can, it's in R as well, we use grep, right? It's it's something that you can do to filter data, to count things in your data. So yeah, for sure. And yeah, so I will repeat the step with nano. So I will just I write again nano and then the name that it could be any name I want to give to my script and then dot sh, which is like that it's a cell script, it's like a bus cell script. It's a type of uh, script that yeah, I need to indicate. And then when I click this, I copy paste my command. So the first few lines here just uh, indicate again what type of script it is. Then there are some information about processing, how long the job, uh, what is the limit, the time limit for the job, a name for the job. This is this can be up to me. And then after, when you have the has, hashtag uh, as usually, it means that there are, the code is not going to be processed as a command, but it's a comment. It's a comment uh, code. So after the comment lines, then I ask module load this spades thing. So this line is going to load this software that is called spades and it's installed into a folder that's called bioinfo. So this is, I'm quite lucky because the cluster that I'm sewing has this software already installed and running, so I just need to load it. Then the next command is gonna make a new folder for me to put my output, so my the results that the script is gonna generate. And then the other line is the actual command that will make the assembly. So everything is really in this line. So what this line does, it's it's going to call the spades uh, software. Then we have what we call the flags, which are options after uh, the software name. So here I want to do something that is called meta. We don't have to think about it too much now. Uh, and then I will put as minus one, it's the forward reads, and I will give the path to my forward reads, my raw data. Then minus two will be the reverse reads, so again, the rest of my raw data. And I can't see the rest because it's too small, the window is too small. I'll try to see how to display this without changing things too much. OK. And after I indicate the input, so the, the raw data, then I, I also type minus O, which is the output, and I basically give the directory, so the folder of where I want the output to be. And if I want to save the script, you kind of have to follow the instructions that are on the bottom of the script. So if you want to write it, write out, then you would have to say, you would have to type this. So I do that and suddenly it, it says, okay, do you really want this to be the name? And then I say, I just press enter and then I can just exit. So now we have the script. But the problem is that now we have to make it exec executable. This is just an extra step. So basically, in order to be sure that you can run it, I need to make sure that it's executable. And where did I put this? Okay. Okay, so to make it executable, I say change mode. This is the command for change mode. And then I want all users to gain access to execute, let's say. So this will tell me, the A will tell me that 
everyone will get the plus will tell me that it's it's gaining uh, some kind of functionality and then the X will tell me that it's executable. So I want everyone to have this script as executable and then I write, I type my script and now it will be executable. So it means that I can, I can actually run it as a script and the way I run it is that I will send it to the processor of this cluster by using this command. So s paths and then my script. So this is just going to make my script run. And yeah, I have to make it this way because when very often when you're using a cluster and a lot of people are using a lot of different scripts to do multiple jobs, uh, you kind of have to send your job as a separate script that then will be given some kind of priority uh, into the computing, let's say, space of the computer. So now I click enter and you can see that it says job submitted. So now if everything has gone well, this script should be running and generating an assembly based on my raw data. And there are ways to see the process of your job, but I will now skip this for now. Um, but because I have done this before, I have already downloaded this data into my computer. So I know how they look. So wh what I will do now is I will exit the cloud, the cluster, and I will try to run the same software spades into Galaxy. So if I want to exit the cluster, I just type exit and enter. And now you can see it says that the connection is closed and it's back to my, my computer. So I don't need this right now, so I will just close it. So and Terry, I'm... there was a question in the chat um, oh, about, you talk. mentioned the course that you went on. How, how long was the course? How much training did you take before you started uh, exploring the, these uh, tools on your own? Yeah, so this course was part of my DDP, so uh, the, the PhD program, and I think it was maybe one, two month course scattered over like several weeks. So we had a few lessons every week. So I don't know how many hours it would be cumulatively, but it was an introductory course to RNA-Seq. Are, are the course materials open? Mm. I will have to see. OK, and there's another question. Were you studying in Toulouse? Oh, uh, no, I was not studying in Toulouse, but I did part of the. We generated the sequence data while I was in the in a lab in the south of France. And the Institute is using the Toulouse cluster. So basically a cluster like this, not every Institute even has access like has access on its own like super high computing power machine. So a lot of institutes kind of use the same the same cluster. And the institute I was working with was using the cluster in Toulouse. So if I want to do the same thing in Galaxy, so this is the um, interface of Galaxy Online. So home, let's go to the home. So the the site is called is called Galaxy, and you if you just want to use the general, not for example European version, you just go to usegalaxy.org, and this is what you first see. Um, and you can see that already here on the left, you have some tools, and you, it tells you that they're genomic tools, common genomic tools. It tells you genomic analysis, assembly alignment. So obviously this is something that people are using to do this similar analysis to make assemblies. So what I will do is like I will make a new history. So let's say we have nothing in the into the platform. I'm already by the way signed in. It's free to make an account. So if you make an account 
you have uh, access to the class to, to this Galaxy cluster. Uh, and it's free and you usually have enough enough space and memory to process data. So now I'm signed in and let's say here there is nothing and I want to input some data. So I will upload the same data that I was processing in the cloud. So I will just say choose local files and then I will choose the two files. So one is the forward reads and the other one is the reverse reads. It's the same raw data that uh, I inputted, that I used as input in spades. And I will upload. It shouldn't take too long. Uh, then, okay, maybe say start. Okay, so when I close this window, now I can tell that those two files have been added in my history. And they are still kind of loading, uploading in this case. So first, first one is ready, and if I want to have a quick look, I can click on this eye. I should be able to see something. Okay, so in this case, I might not be able to see something actually, and it could be related to the fact that this is a, a compressed file. But if I just click on it, then it gives me some kind of, oh, it's still loading. Okay, I might not be able to view it, but it's I can see it. my guess too, because it's a gzip file. Yeah. I might not be able to view it. But okay, even if I can't view it, I can still do some analysis. So for example, if I was to do, to try to run spades again, fair, of course I can start scrolling and see if they have spades somewhere here, like easy, fast access, or I can just start typing spades. And I see that there are, under, there are some options for me. And I actually know in advance that Metaspace will be the tool for me because spades and metaspades are kind of similar, a similar thing anyway. So I will use metaspades. And when I click on it, all these options appear in front of me. So I indeed have paired and read, so I have forward and reverse. So I will Mm, yeah, I will click this option. I will keep all the default values if I have if I have no reason to change it. And then I need to indicate which uh, which files I want to process. And then if I click here, it will give me the option to choose one of the ones that I just uploaded. So I will say my forward reads is number one and then my reverse is number two. And then everything else is left by default. And you can also just make sure that you get a notification when the job is finished and I will start running the tool. So this is very similar to what I did with a script before. So I have my data and I run spades. In one, in one occasion, I had to, use, to run spades by writing the script myself and loading the software from the computer. Well, in this case, I am just using an online platform that I am just clicking things, clicking options and it's doing a very similar procedure. So I have already run spades in Galaxy because this might take a, a while. I just need to switch to a previous history. Okay, 
So here I have some information coming from Metaspades. So the the script the sorry the software has run on the on the cluster remotely and it has given me some results. So some of these files here on the right are let's say not the most useful for me. If I have want to have a quick look and I press this I okay it gives me the sequences. What I'm mostly interested at the moment is the assembly itself. So I have a file that is called condix and a file that is called scaffolds. And usually scaffolds means that it's longer and fewer than condix. So I will just click on scaffolds. And I see indeed that now I don't have a fastq file anymore. I have a FASTA file. I have the name of the sequence with a unique name, then the length, and then the coverage. So how many individual raw reads have been used to generate um, this scaffold? So this is an average for every position. So this is basically what I need. This is the assembly. And I did this by doing the same steps that I showed you. This is just that I have repeated the process before. So I'm not sure if it's worth doing the extra step of I of I trying to identify the specific allele because this might take a bit of time because I was planning to do the same in the terminal and in the cluster. But the, the approach would be kind of similar. So in Galaxy, I would still need to click. For example, I would use BLAST. So I can just type BLAST and see what tools are related to BLAST. But something important about Galaxy is that when you are using the command line, let's say, you have to be aware of what you are doing and you are kind of responsible of all the processes you make yourself and you need to take your own notes. And the way I work, because I use the command line a lot, I actually use scripts like this in a very old fashioned way. And I try to annotate them and comment of what every command does for me. But at the end of the day, it's a TXT that I curate and I'm responsible for making sure that the code is in the right line, that I run it properly, and it's just not a set of random nodes. While in places like Galaxy, you have something that is like the history. So you, the, the site itself records every click so that you know exactly what you have done. So for example, this is my current history. So what I have been doing. So it's very short. It just tells me that I have these files and I have the output of spades. But if I click here on the arrow, there is something that is, there are some useful tools. For example, I can share this history so that someone else can see exactly what I have done. Or I can extract workflow. And this is very useful because by the time I click extract work workflow, I see all the steps. In this case, it was a very short workflow, so it's not very impressive, but it's still. And then I click, I can give it a name. I can say that this is called Harug. And then I say create. And if I now go up here, which is my workflows, I can see it. This is the new one, less than a minute ago. I just created this. So if I click on it, I can view it, I can export it. If I say export, then I can also create an image. And this is a very, very short workflow, basically, because I only did one, one step, really. But you can imagine that if you're doing multiple steps, you can create a picture that will also help you understand what you have done, but also make it clear for other people what you have done. So it's like a visual and also you can create uh, different workflows in different uh, versions, uh, sorry, different formats. 
you can share this. So it's kind of, it's a safe way to know what exactly you have done. So I think I'm going to stop sharing and kind of take any questions or, yeah, think, ask like which, what, which is best and why maybe one is better than the other and stuff like that. Thanks, Soteria. That was uh, really fun for me to watch you go through that. Um, you just asked the question yourself. That's the first one that comes to my mind is back when you were showing the command line, you said this is now my favorite, but then you you showed the uh, web interface that would probably be a lot more familiar to everybody. So why do you like the command line better? Um, I like it because I have a complete, complete like control over the options. Because sometimes if you have a clickable version of a software, uh, you can only have that many options and you only have access to the software that other people have used and make sure that they are installed in Galaxy. While if I'm using the command line, I can easily say that, okay, I want this software, but I want this specific soft version of the software. And I want to be able to run it with an option that maybe is very particular for my data. And I want to tweak the parameters as much as I want. And so, yeah, I feel like the command line gives you a lot of control over exactly what you're doing. So it's like having better precision in a way. And also you don't rely on the cluster in the way that I feel like there is some kind of dependency on other people uploading and maintaining the software. While in the cluster, it's it's a bit more. I don't know, it's kind of safer for me now to use the command line that rather than an external. Platform like Galaxy. I noticed you had a lot of. Um storage space on your on the cluster that you're using and um i wonder how much free persistent storage you have on galaxy compared to how much you have on that research grade cluster not not the galaxy isn't research grade it is but i just wondered if they would limit how much memory a random user can can access uh so galaxy tells me that we have 250 gigabyte this quota. Gigs. Okay. And I'm and using how, very little of it. Yeah, yeah, okay. 250 gigs is very generous for a, you said it was free. I, I sometimes think about um, that word with research tools that are open. Um, so it is paid for by EU science funding and um, it's a, an amazing resource that people around the world use. Uh, and individual people can use it, yeah, as you say, for free, but it has been funded by the uh, EU uh, Science Fund. Yeah. Any questions? Can we open it up uh, to some questions? Does anybody else have some questions? Everybody stunned after seeing a lot of command line stuff. Nobody has any questions. I, I have a few more, um, but do interject if you have some questions. But so in my bioinformatics days, um, I in fact, I moved to England. Uh, my first job was as a bioinformaticist at the University of Manchester, where I worked for six years and uh, was in the bioinformatics department. And back then, Galaxy had just launched. This was about 20 years ago. And um, I was working on a project called BioLinux that uh, was very similar to the Galaxy project, but um, to put it bluntly, it was just crappier than Galaxy in every respect. Uh, it was smaller, less people worked on it, it was less slick. And um, the way that I view these tools is you, you have the same exact set of little tools in BioLinux, NERC, it was a NERC funded project. 
BioLinux um, Galaxy has ex exactly the same tools as you demonstrated. And you can have all the these little tools as Python or um, compiled uh, bits that that you compile locally on whatever server you're using, even your local desktop for small uh, amounts of data, unless you have a, a research capable workstation. But a thing that I have always thought of with bioinformatics is that in the spirit of science, uh, there's this engineering a uh, pioneering spirit of inventing tools to um, do something good. And there is a tradition in, in biology and in some other fields too. You invent a tool that does something good and you release it into the wild to share it um, as open source software uh, or as at least as openly accessible software. And um, I, don't, I don't know of a lot of bioinformatics tools, not that would fit into a real research pipeline that are fully commercial. And the good part of that is you can use these uh, tools that are paid for by research funding tax um, money, ultimately. You can use them at the as a user for free. Um, but the downside is that because they're not commercial tools, they're quite difficult to use and there's a learning curve you've been you've started from as you, you put it um from ground zero and uh, you 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 doing some uh, pretty pretty advanced things i'd i'd say now and and it's been how long have you been using it and where would you like to be by the end of your phd let's say um yeah, I think I started at the start of my PhD, so it's it's almost three years now. Mm -hmm. And I've been using it almost nonstop because my whole project is basically bioinformatics. Yeah. But I still, what I feel like I still like is the sense of bringing the big concepts together because I know how to do a few jobs, but I don't understand a lot of what's going on behind the scenes or how how what I do can impact like sometimes I get like systems that are incompatible or I know that using conda or anaconda so there are some basics that I still cannot get the grip of properly so yeah, by the end of my PhD, I would like to be more confident in that not only can I do the job, but I understand how this fits into the whole analysis and setup. Thank you. Another, oh, Sarah's got her hand up, go on. Hello, that was very interesting, thank you. I might have missed you saying this at the beginning, but I was interested to know what that data was. Is it one cell from the bacteria? Um, and is bacteria DNA? Because I think some viruses are RNA. Um, perhaps you could explain what the, back, what the actual data was, you know, the codes of the A's and T's and things. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. So yeah, these are all bacterial sequences coming from definitely a lot of cells from bacteria it's actually a bacterial genome that has been fished out of a mix of insect and bacterial genome so this is kind of a bigger bigger question but it's it should be bacterial genome yeah and we are targeting whole genome is that kind of yes thank you David's got a question. Yeah, I think the last answer might have partly answered my question. I was trying to sort of think about everything that we'd heard in the last hour. Uh, and I was thinking, you know, uh, students today basically will walk out with knowing how to use a Microsoft platform in terms of words and PowerPoint and what have you. And increasingly people will learn how to use R. And I was wondering, is this piece of software, whether you're using the, the coding version or the Galaxy version, uh, something 
which is very, very specialised. Um, and when you then uh, get a job afterwards, does that mean you have, the world is your oyster because there are very few people who can use it? But from what has been said in the last few minutes, I think bioinformatics is probably a big area that I, that I didn't realise how big it was. Um, so I was just trying to get a feel for how important is it this piece of or the, using these bits of software in terms of uh, the general scientific world? Yeah, so I think what I'm trying to achieve now with my PhD is probably like getting the answer for my PhD will be the least useful. The process will probably be the most useful. It's that way for everyone. <laughs> Yeah, so yeah, basically everyone I know that works with genomics or yeah, even proteomics, like evolutionary biology, molecular biology, at some point they will have to use similar tools and whether they go all the way with using command line, I'm not sure, but certainly, certainly platforms like Galaxy, people are using more and more and the more you talk about people with people, you start using the same vocabulary about bioinformatics and it's kind of nice to see that everyone is at the same stage. So yeah, I think it's something, it's a, it's a skill that is useful besides the PhD for sure. Right, thank you. It, it does also raise questions in, in terms of if you think about a traditional undergraduate, so it probably it probably is still postgraduate, but if you think about uh, an undergraduate student, then typically they might be doing sort of uh, an honours research project whereby they do a classical experiment uh, or they might have a questionnaire or something like that. They'll analyse it, say doing an ANOVA test or something of that nature. Um, but there's a whole level of other tools that are used certainly at uh, PhD level and I just wonder how many of those will actually find their way drifting if you want to use that terminology down into undergraduate um, programs. Yeah, a thing that I would say about bioinformatics and then swing around to your question David is that um, in, in bioinformatics, uh, a thing that I encountered personally, and I observe it in students I've worked with over the years, including you, Satiri, we've never really talked about this, but um, when I came into this bioinformatics department, I was a statistician, and I had had a little programming, but almost all the people working around me had degrees in computer science, uh, PhDs in computer science, and um, I had to catch up on the computing side, and I also had a background in biology, so understanding the um, source of the data and the kinds of questions that were being asked, it was probably easier for me to do that than it was the computer scientists who had come into bioinformatics. Uh, and when you showed your data, Soteria, you're using this um, FASTQ uh, files, I, I was only analyzing FASTA files, a certain kind of sequencing data, and the technology um, determines the structure of the data, but the kinds of questions you ask are very transferable. And swinging back to your question about undergrad education and stuff like that, there's a trend uh, in, in my world. I can see it in other universities in the UK and uh, it's been around in the U.S. a little longer, but it's coming here and it will come here. There's a trend to teach, especially in engineering, but also in other science fields like biology. Um, students um, these days, we, we used to teach when I was in school and when David, when you were in school, uh, they would teach us how to use computers, but they don't teach students how to do that anymore. But there is a trend to bring that back in the sciences uh, and to teach students how to um, how to create reproducible analyses and to teach students how to how to program or at least think uh, think algorithmically. And that itself is a very transferable skill. And at least you understand where the uh, where the data are coming from and 
chat GPT probably is going to change how we view the training of students because uh, there's this steep learning curve of learning the code. And now uh, we have these modern tools that will reduce that learning curve. But the thing that won't be reduced is um, is insight, critical insight on how to ask those scientific questions. That's always been the hard part to teach. And um, chat GPT won't won't reduce the learning curve on that, but it does really help uh, to understand a little bit how to make computers do your bidding. I can tell you that it's very transferable. Uh, I feel like we should be teaching undergrads more and we also should have a for PhD students, I guess through our MIB TP uh, and, and similar programs that fund PhDs, we do have some computational training for for students that need it. But but so Terry, I feel your journey. You've been I, I know at times you have felt a little on your own with it here in, in Harper, but there are some other students. There are at least a couple of others who uh, also are using these tools and mounting the learning curve. So. I, I think it will be more and more transferable and job worthy for employability in the future. Maybe it will open up your future to different kinds of jobs, so Terry, that you wouldn't do before. I mean, I assume you don't think your time learning this stuff is wasted and you feel empowered if you can take a breath and uh, allow yourself to feel that way. <laughs> Unless I keep getting failed when I submit my jobs. <laughs> yeah, failed messages are hard to swallow sometimes, but <laughs> that sense of joy when you do fix a problem and the script just runs, that keeps you going sometimes. <laughs> this has been such a, such a fun uh, session for me to watch. Thank you, Sotiri. Any final questions or comments? If there's not, I'll just thank you once again, Sotiri, and thanks everybody for coming. Yeah, and thank uh, you. may I ask you to drop your PowerPoint in and I'll upload that for everyone's benefit yes. and yes. I'll see everyone later. I'm going to go off and enjoy the rest of my holiday. <laughs> Bye. Thank you, Ed. Bye, everyone. Yeah, enjoy your break, Ed. Bye.